So before I start sharing the um, PowerPoint for worship, I did just want to say welcome to worship here at Heritage, uh, virtu Heritage Virtual Worship uh, that we will be doing for the next four weeks uh, as a part of the directed health measures. Uh, we wanted to try Zoom worship as a way to kind of still be more present with each other, even though we have to be separate in our own homes. So thank you for giving this a shot. Thank you for logging on. Thank you for working with us as we try to figure out how to be the church in the pandemic. Um, just a couple of points um, for the Zoom video itself. Um, Scott will be muting everybody. But as we get started here, so you won't have to worry about muting yourself. If there is a point where you want to say something, you will have to unmute yourself, though. And that button can usually be found at the bottom left of your screen. There's a little microphone and it should say mute or unmute. Uh, during times when we're like this, um, at the top right, there is a little button that says view. Um, you can change that to gallery view so that you're looking at everybody, or you can change that to speaker view so it's just showing you the video of the person who is actively speaking. Um, I think that's all I've got for you right now. Um, the, oh, the other note that I wanted to say is that at the bottom, right in the middle, there's a little button that says chat. Uh, feel free to post things in that chat. Um, if you have questions, if you just have things that you want to share, if you feel more comfortable saying something than unmuting yourself uh, that way, please feel free to utilize that function. We would love to hear what you have to say, whether it's voiced or written. So let us go to God and worship together. Please join with me in the call to worship. We have come to worship God, the living God, 
who called prophets and teachers to bear witness. We have come to praise God, the almighty God, who answers the forces of hatred and hurt with the power of grace. We have come to worship God, all gracious God, who chooses even you and me to receive and carry the word of life and hope. All glory to God. And now our prayer of confession. Creator God, we know that you have made us to work with one another as one body. But too often, we find it easier to stay with what feels familiar or comfortable. We set priorities that serve our own interests. When we see pain and injustice, we try not to share in suffering. Yet we are eager to share in celebration we have neglected to earn. We cling to our individualism and abandon the call to be generous caretakers of the whole of your creation. Guide us to the path you have set out for all for us all to follow. Embolden us to honor both the gifts in ourselves as well as the gifts in others. Strengthen us to live into our discomfort so that we may be the one body you have created us to be. Amen. And now let us have a moment of reflection of our own confession. Amen. Though we fall short, God's forgiveness never ceases. Live into the good news that in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and freed to answer God's call to live as one body. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also, also with, you. with you. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the first letter to the church in Corinth. Listen for the word of the Lord. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If a foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. All are apostles, all are prophets, are all teachers. Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, during my time at seminary, there was a move at the national level of our denomination to change the official titles of our pastors from ministers of the word and sacrament to teaching elders. The reason behind this was to remove a sense of hierarchy that often becomes entwined with the phrase minister of word and sacrament. It's loftiness and grandeur often makes it seem like us ministers are more important than those ordained as ruling elders, which is really not the case. In terms of running the church, ruling elders and the pastor should be on equal footing. In terms of participants of the church, those officially ordained and those not are equal and should be able to equally participate in the regular happenings of the church. This is just one of the many ways we are all different parts of the body with different strengths and functions, but are still one body. I am not more important than any of you just because I hold the title of reverend or pastor. You are all just as important to the life and the function of this church. The same can be said about the different levels of the church within the PCUSA. The congregation, the presbytery, the synod, and the general assembly all are unique and important parts that make up the body of the denomination, and we would have a hard time functioning without each of them. 
Each level relies on the others to provide support and nourishment in this, the body of Christ. And because we are one body but different parts of it, no one level of the church is more important than the other. The General Assembly is not inherently more valuable than any individual congregation. And in fact, the General Assembly would not exist without those individual congregations doing the daily work of being the church that the assembly helps support. The significance of this means that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. To put it simply, when we all work together, individually as people and communally as different functions and levels of the church, two plus two can indeed add up to five. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Being the body of Christ is a beautiful conglomeration of different structures, people, minds, and souls that lead to a better denomination together than we can ever hope to be apart. The reason this is all so important is because today in the Presbyterian Church, churches all across the country will be talking about per capita for today is per capita Sunday. I'm sure many of you have heard that phrase thrown around, but might not really understand what it is. Directly translated, per capita means for the individual or for each person. For us Presbyterians, it is a sort of tithe that we give for each person once every year. Thankfully, we pay only for those who are listed as an active member and not for every person who walks into our doors. As opposed to the money that you regularly give in the plates every week, uh, which is something that we focused on last November during Stewardship Sunday, per capita doesn't stay with us. Per capita is set aside to support the other levels of the church the presbyteries, the synods, and the general assembly. This year, per capita is $45 and about 10 cents per active member. Of that $45 per person, a little over $30 will go to Homestead Presbytery. $5.50 will go to the Synod of Lakes and Prairies, and just under $9 goes to the general assembly. This money enables those different levels of the church to do their specific functions of ministry. In Homestead Presbytery, this money pays for our executive presbyter, Stephen Earle. It pays for our stated clerk, who currently is Ray Meester, but in a month or so will be me. Um, some per capita funds go into an account every year that um, are put aside for triennium expenses. So those have helped pay for transportation and grants provided to our youth to attend triennium in the past. And it will be this year if things get put together and COVID doesn't stop us from going. Per capita allows the presbytery to provide support to congregations if they need um, any help. And sometimes the benefits are not always visible, but we do see them all the same. The one thing I'd like to highlight for that is that these funds will go to the Committee on Preparation for Ministry and will be used to support and train our candidates, who then in turn will go on to be leaders in the church themselves, giving back the gifts they got through their time, talents, and leadership. For example, Gina Meester, who is under care at this church here. At the synod level, these funds pay for our synod executive, Alona Street Stewart. I assume that some of these funds will also go to pay for synod school, which I know many of you have attended and are fond of. Um, however, I wasn't able to find their budget to be sure. At the general assembly level, these funds pay for our denomination stated clerk, and for the many committees that do the regular work of the denomination. 
I myself am on one of those committees, the Advisory Committee on Social Witness Policy. And this particular committee creates policies and educational documents that help guide and educate the denomination on what we believe and how those beliefs live into our daily lives. For example, I've been working on updating a document called Comfort My People, which seeks to educate churchgoers about mental illness. On this committee, I received direct benefit from per capita funds because it is those funds allotted to the committee that have allowed us in the past to travel to different locations and learn about issues on the ground, which informs the work that we do. These funds allow us to bring in experts in the field to help write these documents and pay them for their time. And as we move into an increasingly digital world, these funds will allow us to create videos and more robust online materials that will be used in Bible studies, sermon illustrations, Sunday school classes, and more. These resources, once created, are then available to the churches for free. As with Stewardship Sunday last November, I wanted to shed light on what per capita is and how it benefits us, even if we don't get to use that money ourselves. If you have any other questions about why we pay per capita and what it goes towards, please reach out to me and I'm happy to have discussions around it. But this is just one of the ways that we take care of the body of Christ that we call the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, and how we are able to function as a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. So as you go into this week, contemplate how your money, your time, and your talents plays into the body of Christ here at Heritage and in the world. Know that you are a vital piece of that body, not only in this congregation, but in the denomination at large. Know that you are beloved by God and that you have so much to offer to the world and so much to be proud of. Let us go out into the world and do it together. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you today in confidence for this world in which we live is your world, brought into being through your love for all your people. Lord, we pray pray that you will teach us all how to provide for our own lives, mindful of our own needs, yet also of the call of Christ to put our trust in him. Help us to spend our time and our money in a manner worthy of your kingdom of love. Lord, make this church a place of generosity where people work together, giving all that they are and all that they have so that the wonderful resources of of our world may be better shared. We pray today for people who wander through life constantly seeking a purpose, a reason for living. We remember especially those who store up wealth for themselves, believing that the road to happiness is through the accumulation of possessions. Help them to find in you love, acceptance, and wholeness. We make our prayers as part of our common life of worship and service to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hear us as we pray as our Father taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Bountiful God, you have given each of us unique ways to be part of this united body called the church. We give thanks for your invitation to live generously, empowering us to see connections between ourselves and all members. We offer these gifts today in support of per capita so that we can join in supporting the work of the PCUSA as one body answering God's call to serve. Amen. Spirit is still at work among us, disciples of Christ, sending us to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to those in captivity, to be healers and a freedom force against all oppression. Go boldly as disciples, trusting in the Spirit's guidance. Amen. Amen.
Amen.